Well, authorities near Rochester, New York, say they have solved one of the oldest and coldest murder cases in America, known as the Brighton Axe Murder. In a preview of Saturday night's 48 Hours, a correspondent, Aaron Moriarty, explains why it took prosecutors four decades to file charges and why some people still insist they have the wrong man. On February 19, 1982, Jim Krausnick, a Kodak company economist, says he came home to find his 29-year-old wife, Kathy, dead in bed with an ax in her head and his three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Sarah, alone but unharmed. It was a single blow to the head, and she died instantly. She didn't know what hit her? She would have had no idea. Inside the house, valuables were scattered as if by a burglar, but retired Brighton police detective Mark Libertor and his partner, Detective Steve Hunt, say that unlike a burglary, nothing was taken. This burglar was staged. Near the valuables, a shoe print in a bag as if to hold it open. Detectives now think it came from Jim Krausnick's boat shoes, but the shoes were never tested, and back then, there was no obvious motive and no direct evidence against him, so the case went cold. Until 2019, when forensic pathologist Michael Bodden, hired by Monroe County authorities, determined that Kathy Krausnick likely died before her husband left for work. Krausnick was charged with a murder that he and his attorneys, Bill Easton and Michael Wolford, insist he didn't commit. Someone came in and killed Kathy Krausnick. We think that someone was Ed Larrabee. Ed Larrabee, a violent sexual predator who lived only a half mile from the Krausnicks. What's more, before dying in prison in May 2014, Ed Larrabee actually confessed to killing Kathy Krausnick. But DA Sandra Dorley doesn't believe it. His confession didn't match up to the facts. Larrabee had described Kathy having dark hair. She was blonde. He said he had sexually assaulted her, but there was no evidence of that. Authorities say Kathy's killer is her husband. So you're saying that this man, who had never shown any sign of violence before and never shows any violence after, snaps one night in his life and puts an ax in his wife's head? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Aaron Moradi is uh, here with me now in Studio 57 to talk more about this case. This very I, I mean, unusual you case. You saw me listening to this. I mean, it, it, like every sentence that came out of your mouth, there was like an, another thing and another thing. Um, this is a very unusual case. It's one of the most unusual cases that I think I've ever encountered. And as you know, and you There's do, a, yeah. I think I've seen it all. Number one, it is the fact that it's one of the coldest cases to go to trial mm -hmm. 40 years after the murder. And that's such a problem, mm -hmm. in, both in prosecuting it and defending it. Um, and then the axe. That is such an unusual murder weapon. Mm -hmm. um, every investigator I spoke to had never encountered an axe murder before. And let me point out one other thing. Uh, an axe is a weapon of anger, and she's hit with a single blow. I talked to a uh, former FBI profiler who told me how unusual that is. Mm. Um, and then you have this defendant. Um, no obvious motive, no, if they were having marital problems, neither no. one told anyone. Mm. No violence before, no violence afterwards, and to, and if he did this, he left his three and a half year old daughter in the home all day. So she's there while her mother is dying in the home? Yes. Was she able to help in any way in terms of this case? I don't know, you know, three year olds can be articulate. Absolutely, they yeah. can. And they, I mean, they're like little people. Mm. They do see things. I think the investigators hoped because initially she said she saw a bad man, but the more they pushed her to describe that bad man, she said at first that he had a hammer in his head, then an ax in his head, and that he was multicolored. And so I think mm. investigators concluded that she didn't recognize her mom, and it was actually her mom that she oh, was looking my at. God. Which, that which is... breaks my heart yeah. because she was there all day and she dressed herself. It's, <sighs> it's, it had to be traumatizing. That's a lot. Uh, and so then you have this sexual predator. And um, Larrabee. Right, and when, when you brought that up, I looked straight at you, but then we hear about this confession that's like not a really solid confession. And Was he looked at at the time? Well, to add to that, exactly. So, yes, he lived very close to the Krausnecks. They did look at him. Whether 
they investigated him is another story. Yeah. They went to talk to him. He refused to speak to them. And for some reason, um, I, I mean, and I think it's clear that they dropped the ball because they didn't even see whether he had gone to work that day, whether he had an alibi. So then years later, when he has ALS, he's dying, he's trying to make a deal, he starts confessing to crimes. But it's years later. I mean, in my mind, could he have confused the housewife in Rochester with another woman that sure, he Sure, the dark abused. hair, light hair. I mean, these are details you could forget. But again, and then the other really unusual part of this story, would Ed Larrabee, though, stage the crime scene? And there was evidence that the crime scene had been staged, that it looked right. like a burglary, but everything was left very neatly on the ground. And that's why investigators were looking at the husband. But this husband, who doesn't have any clear motive, there's no direct evidence it's it is an unusual case yeah. and fascinating one. It, it certainly sounds like this. Uh, can't wait until Saturday, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emory. You can watch Aaron Moriarty's report, the Brighton Axe murder, on Forty Eight Hours. That's tomorrow night at ten, nine central on CBS, and on our streaming service, Paramount Plus.